Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Uh, before we get started, I want to make your attention to uh, point your attention to these flowers here. These flowers are presented by Macy's Flower Show, which is currently up until April. You can check it out in three different cities, New York, San Francisco, and Chicago. They're really beautiful. We're really thankful of Macy's for giving us these wonderful flowers that are sitting right behind me. Now, whether it's his podcast or stand-up, Tom Segura is one of the funniest comics around. His new special, Disgraceful, is available now on Netflix. Let's take a look at a clip. I'm very philosophical, you guys. Now, physical flaws are funny. They just are. Disabilities are not. But some are. And if you're sitting here and you're like, when is it ever funny? Some people experience head trauma, not funny. But they wake up speaking their native language with a foreign accent. Very funny. <laughs> Did you hear what I just fucking said? <laughs> like a farmer in Alabama who's normally like, bup, 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 bup. that guy hits his head and is now like, eh, the tractor trailer, it, eh, it fell. A la man. That's not funny to you, you piece of shit, really? Everybody, give it up for Tom. No? No, no good to you? I mean, not the only yourself? thing worse than watching yourself do stand-up is watching a trailer of yourself doing stand-up, you know? Why is the trailer worse? Because I remembered trying to put it together. Oh, you, you put this trailer together? Well, I didn't put it together, but they kept sending me, like, versions, and I was like, nah. And then they're like, hey, you keep saying no. We have, like, a day left. Yeah, you have to agree to we this. We have to lock it down. And then I was like, just do what you want. <laughs> like, so now you have to see it, and you're like, oh, no. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, it's so uncomfortable to watch yourself, I think. Can you watch yourself at all, generally? Or only, really, if you're kind of, like, giving notes or feedback yeah. or being critical? Yeah, yeah, being like in the edit bay when you're yep. going through it and you're like, cut that. cut that, leave that in. But then like, I don't sit at home like, ah, oh, me. Like, honey, honey, get the kids. Yeah, Let's yeah. watch my stand up. Let's watch me again. No. Yeah, it's hard to, I guess. Are you, uh, are you, do you find that you're, you're good at being critical of yourself? You're good at editing yourself at Oh, I think point? so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe too much. Like you're ruthless. You're kind of like. Yeah, I could put mine on and be like, just cut the whole thing. Yeah. Just, <laughs> I hate me entirely. <laughs> I know that feeling. Yeah. You start and you're like, oh, God, what an asshole. Just remove everything, yeah, please. Yeah, take the whole thing out, man. No, I mean, it's, I, can, I can, like, it's, it's, what you find is that if you do find a moment that you actually like, that is worth celebrating, you know, because you don't watch your, your own whole thing like, yay, I'm the best. You, you, kind of, you actually get to get, get to a moment where you're like, if, oh, that's not bad. Yeah, yeah, then you're like, oh, wow, I should just tap out now because I'm actually enjoying it for a moment. Um, how long have you been uh, developing the material for this special? Um, I mean, that one probably, I guess I started it, um, you know, I toured all of, or half of 2016, all of 2017. So that was like a year and a half, almost two years. You were touring for a year and a half? More. Wow. Yeah. Because I never stopped, really. I never, like, I, even when I shot, I shot this in September. Mm -hmm. I kept touring October, November. Uh, beginning of December, it came out in January. I've been on the road, like trying to do a new hour. How do you deal with that uh, with with your family being on the road so much? Oh, they're cool with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, they hate it. <laughs> no, it's uh, you have to have a balance. I learned on the last tour. The last tour was like the first time I ever did like a really big tour, mm -hmm. like big venues and and when those when they start offering you the shows. You know, it's such a big deal that, that you just accept everything. You're like, yeah, yeah, add that, add that. What? Yeah, of course. And then you are out there, and it's like two weeks in a row, three weeks in a row, four weeks in a row. And you're like, I can't do this. And they're like, well, you've got 12 weeks coming up in a row. So and you're like, what? So that experience of doing it wrong taught me how to do it the way I do it now, which is like I definitely won't do more than two weekends in a month. So it's like, yeah, I might leave Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but I'll come home and then it's only going to be one other time. You just, just have to record your podcast. You have to record the podcast. <laughs> um, but you also just realize that it, you'll just burn out. It, it's not fun to do it that much. 
to be traveling in a new room and a new hotel and a new show every time. You're just like, dude, I'm, I can't do this. Yeah, hotels, I mean, it's they're, hotels are great, but they're also kind of overrated when you're spending all that time in them. Totally. And I also had a, like, because I was used to doing the club format before, which is you fly in and you're there for the weekend. And last year it was basically New City. Every, so it would be like Thursday, Madison, Friday, Milwaukee, Saturday, Chicago. And I thought that would be exciting. I'd be like, oh, cool, new city every day. I was just like, fuck this. This is awful. Like, I want to just live in one place for a few days. Yeah, I don't, I'm not a fan of it. Is Denver your favorite place to perform? This is shot in Denver. There's some, uh, you know, you say some very nice things about Denver at the beginning. Uh, it's one of them, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's the best. If not the best, it's one of the top three comedy cities in America. Um, what are the other, what, what would you say the other two are? I don't know. I mean, comics will give you this, this answer based on where do they always have great shows, you know? So you credit Denver because you have to credit, there's a woman named Wendy Curtis who owns a club there called Comedy Works. Mm -hmm. And there's two of them, but the downtown location is highly regarded as the best comedy club in America. And I think it's because she prioritizes comedy. Like her, her focus isn't on chicken fingers, right. which is what like a lot of comedy clubs are just like, yeah, but how can we sell them more burgers, you know? She's like all about comedy and she's trained the audience to love comedy. So you have like a comedy savvy crowd, even when they're going to see someone they don't know. So in other words, even when you're unknown, those crowds are unreal. Do you, ta do you find that you tailor your material for a New York audience versus a Denver audience or an no. LA audience versus a... Not at all. I don't care enough. <laughs> and <laughs> I feel like... I feel it's like... like kind of badass, but also kind of lazy. I'm not sure where you're straddling I think it's that. lazier. It's lazy, um, okay. Yeah. No, because I feel like... If, I don't care about the fucking audience because I'm too lazy <laughs> to try. <laughs> I mean, here's the thing. If you're like an entertainer, then I think that's your instinct. You're like talking and then you're like, they don't like this? I'm going to switch it up and see if they like that. And I'm like, nah, I'm just going to do what I got. <laughs> and uh, if they don't like it, then they just didn't like me. You know? It just yeah. feels like... It feels more genuine. <laughs> do you still have that experience at this stage? I mean, like, every city is not going to be the same. I, I don't think that if the audience is coming out to see me specifically that they're going to be like, the fuck's this all about? Yeah, but, like, yeah. you know, that would be weird if they're like, we bought tickets, we know you, but we're not digging it. I don't, I don't know. But, um, no, nah, but, but some cities or some shows just kind of go, you're like, oh, this kind of felt weird or just didn't. Especially, I don't know, you, you have some shows where it goes so gangbusters from the beginning that's like, why you do it because it's so fun that when anything is not like that you always feel like oh what, what was up with that you know yeah. how do you how do you change that how do you figure that out you just naturally kind of yeah it's i think it's it's a good thing to never be look you wouldn't want all the shows to be like that and you shouldn't get too high from that and then when shows suck you'd also don't want to ingest that as as like the reality of where you are, you know, like you don't want to get too low from bad shows. It's actually best to be kind of in the middle right. and to have both experiences all the time, you know, because like, both experiences make you realize that you can always be working on what your craft and like figuring something out and, and also not get too complacent with where you're at. Do you find that's why comedians like um, Dave Chappelle or something will go still to a comedy club and do like, three and a half hours of made up material off the top of his head just so he can potentially have a bomb rather than have like a I don't know I mean Dave likes doing intimate small shows yeah like he actually likes those the most he likes doing the belly room at the comedy store which is 80 seats um I think he actually enjoys the intimacy of real stand-up which is in a small you know, once you start getting into, like, 2,500, 5,000 seat venues, I mean, it's not, it's stand-up, but it's like a version of stand-up. Because right. stand-up genuine, like, a genuine stand-up performance should be connected, like, you're intimate with the crowd. So, I don't know, I think maybe he just, 
still gets that thrill. And then someone is like, hey, you know, you, you could do an amphitheater and make like a million dollars. He's like, all right, I'll go do that too. But I mean. What do you prefer? I mean, I'll take a million dollars for right. sure. Right. No, um, it's, I don't know. It's fun. It's fun to mix it up. It's fun to mix it up. What you learn is like the longer you do it, um, you, your show starts to, if you, if you only do big venues, you'll start performing only for big venues. Does that make sense? So it's like, if, I, like if you do nothing but 2,000 seat theaters, like week after week after week, your show becomes a show for a 2,000 seat theater. And then all of a sudden, you go to a 200 seat club and you're performing and it feels awkward. Because you're big, you're, because you're broad you're, and big. And, yeah. yeah. And like I never planned, but like having gone through that, or, and then the opposite can happen. If you do nothing but clubs, and then you go to a huge venue, it's like jarring. So I like having the experience of, of doing both, just because it's, it's fun to have the opportunity to do both, you know, and, and experience the, the full spectrum of sizes. And it's sizes. working out muscles, keeping, it does. keeping everything toned. To it. Yeah, and yeah. it keeps you honest. And it's also why it's good to do shows for not fans, because that will also... Uh, gut check you, you know? <laughs> like, if you just do shows that, like, are just your fans, you perform a certain way, and then all of a sudden you get on a show, you know, whatever, Thursday night, and it's somebody else's show, and you pop on, you'll find out what, what of your material is, like, genuine comedy for anyone, and what is, like, they're laughing because it's you. When did um when did you and your wife decide to do uh, your mom's house with each other, and what spawned that decision? And uh, third part of that question, uh, did you ever imagine it would become uh, you know as kind of well known and and sort of big as it is? It has like a massive fan base. It's crazy, and I definitely did not expect that. I didn't expect it to be a job, like it's a real job. Yeah. Like we have ad sales, <laughs> where like we are not allowed to skip. <laughs> <laughs> like, we used to just be like, do you feel like doing it? And then now it's like, no, no, there's buyers, and you have to do it. Wow. But it's still fun. But, no, it came about 2010. Yeah. I can't believe how long ago that feels now. And it was actually 100% the encouragement of uh, Joe Rogan, mm. who has, like, the biggest podcast. But at the time, his was just also ascending, you know? It was talked about, but it wasn't, like, this absolute massive show that it is today he told me he was like why don't he kept saying like why don't you do a podcast and i was like i don't know dude that's that little radio thing you keep doing why and then he uh he saw my wife at the improv uh in la he's like i saw your wife last night she's hilarious you you guys have to do one together like you live together just do a podcast wake up and go downstairs and do the yeah. podcast yeah and i and i still wasn't sold on it I still asked her, I was like, do you want to do this? Like, it's not my idea, just so you know. Do you want to do it? And she was like, I guess. Like, it was that kind of level of enthusiasm. It's like a, a very good distillation of the show sometimes, though, too. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Do you want to talk about this? I guess. I guess. <laughs> so it was, it was totally... Um, and then the only way we even figured out that there... I didn't know. I thought, like, 30 people listened to it. And then one day I put out a call on the podcast to torture one of my friends on social media. Like, I just asked people to send him messages. And then he was like, oh, I had to delete my account today. Like, he told me, he was like, it's like I got like 5,000 people asking me like for sex and like where to, to meet them, to meet them in a park. And like, I was like, I go, that's what I told them to do. And he was like, what the fuck? So when, when I realized how many people did that, I was like, oh, there's a lot of people listening to this. That's what really gave it away. What's it been like uh, doing this project with her over the years? Would you two work on anything else creatively together? Or was this kind of like the one thing that you think you can do sort of as a married couple creatively? No, I mean... Couples can't, you know... You're right. Yeah. No, we... Um, look, it was, it was so organic and natural, and it's been easy to do this with her. Uh, we did a pilot... Uh, a couple of years ago together that didn't get uh, picked up, but we did that, and then we're we're developing a show together. So we've, we're definitely... You can work together pretty easily. I think so, yeah. I think we have a pretty good... You know, it's like we have that thing where we're not... Um, 
competitive with each other. So I think that's what keeps it, we're able to work together. Because other, other couples I know, like I had a, another comic I know who's married to a comic, and then he goes, um, don't you get pissed when she gets something you don't get? <laughs> and I was like, no. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, but what if she gets booked to do this thing and you don't? And I'm like, well, that check comes to my house. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Like I can stay home that week. That's you have a awesome child week. that yeah. that, th that that check helps. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I think that you know, I mean, I get it. A lot of comics are competitive, but you know, I imagine it's really hard. I mean, you you get into comedy and you have to be incredibly competitive when you first yeah. get started. I imagine it's hard to turn that off in your brain once you get married. For some people, for you guys, it seems like it is. But. Yeah, yeah, probably. I mean, if it's, I think the longer you do it, to um, even though you want to progress. And you know, and and better yourself. The less you look at it as you realize you're not competing with other comics. You're you're competing with yourself. Right. So like, but it's it's hard to come to that early on. You don't realize it. Like you think, if that person does that thing, then I can't do it. And it's not that's not how it works. Well, that's true. Yeah, there was a comic here I think last week who was saying that I thought that at the beginning, but as I progressed, I realized all the things that I was getting in comedy were from from my friends who were getting more success than me. They were kind of trying to pull me along. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, and and it takes it takes a while. I mean, that's just life. It takes a while to figure out that um, there's enough for everybody. Like it's not just you know you're not you're not going to starve because somebody else got a thing you know uh i want to talk about one of the one of the bits in your special yeah. uh where you uh you talk about you're you're good with building walls border walls but you just want to build a border wall around louisiana yeah <laughs> uh that joke hasn't landed that well with some people you said people in louisiana yes, yeah people in louisiana yeah and you have to travel in Louisiana with armed guards now? Yeah. <laughs> That's insane. Well, it was after a certain level and number of death threats, you, um, you have to, like, have the, the conversation where they go, like, uh, hey, you know, these are probably mostly empty death, death threats. And you're like, probably? <laughs> and they're like, I mean, what's the likelihood that one of these hundreds of people that threaten to kill you will do it? And you're like, I don't know. What do you think? They're like, probably not high. And you're like, what should I do? And they're like, probably hire people. <laughs> so so yeah. just when you go to Louisiana, though, you have armed guards? or Yeah, there's going to be like a bigger police presence um, at the venue and then armed security like backstage. Looking and forward the, to the conversation with the police that you have to have when you... I know, when they're like... They're, they're not going to... I can't imagine when they hear the joke, they're going to be... But it's one of those things, though, where from the, the people that messaged... Like, all the messages that I got, a lot were, I live in Louisiana, and I totally got the joke and thought it was yeah. funny. But the thing is, I don't advertise those messages. Like, it's not funny. And it's like, I'm not going to be like, see? People he, like the, me. They like it. Like, so I did draw attention to the negative ones because it's more entertaining, and it's, like, more fun to showcase yeah. people flipping out about it. Crazy. So, I mean, I, I feel like, I don't know. Of course, one of those or all a lot of those cops could be offended, but I don't know. They, they you probably... think you're pretty funny, big yeah. city guy, yeah, something yeah, yeah. like that. They, yeah, I might get a little bit of both, yeah. but That's going to be kind of fun, though. I think it's going to be a really fun <laughs> experience, actually. Because, I, I mean, also, the people coming to the shows, like, they, they were also messaging, like, I'm so excited that you're coming here in lieu of the the joke, you know? So it's like, I, I feel like it's going to be a celebration kind of thing. I think it's going to actually be gangbusters. I do. I really do. There, there were people, though, messaging me like, this is shit I've never heard said before. People were saying, let's save up money now so that we can bail ourselves out of jail when we jump him. Like, that was in a comment thread, and I was like, you're planning bail money? Like... <laughs> Like, I, like, you know, like, you go, like, I'm going to save up to go to the Bahamas. Yeah, you want and to that person say, wouldn't this be better? Wouldn't you be better served planning for something productive yeah. for yourself? Yeah, and they were like, if we start saving now, we can definitely bail out. <laughs> like, and I was like, wow, that's, that's, that is a totally new thing for me. I've never heard that before. 
planning. Why not bail. a charity, guys? Why not nah, something man. To... They're like, we want to hurt you, but then we don't want to have to stay in jail. <laughs> uh, let's get some questions from our audience. Who has a question? Uh, hi. Um, I was wondering uh, what other stand-ups uh, do you listen to? Hmm. If it says you don't listen to yourself, but I was wondering if you listen to other stand-ups and uh, what do you take away from from listening to them? Hmm. No, I hate them all. <laughs> competitive. Yeah. Is that competitive? Yeah. yeah. No, you know, I I mean, I've listened to a lot, obviously, growing up. There is a thing now where, like, especially if you like a comic, you don't want to listen to them too much because you feel like they start to influence you, which we all influence each other. But you know, I mean, there's a lot of great. There's like great known ones, you know, and then uh, like more under the radar kind of guys like um, uh, Jeff Tate, Josh Potter, uh, Matt Fulshron, like all guys that I know that aren't like super well known, but super funny. I mean, of like the the well known crop, it's all like pretty much the names, you know, you know, I mean, it's Bill Burr and Chappelle and uh, Patton and Sarah Silverman, like they're all just like super funny, talented, successful comics. I mean, there's there's little skills I guess that each of them have that are always impressive. Some of them, like I lo I've always loved how casual uh, Chappelle is, like he's so conversational, and I really have been drawn to that style of doing stand up. Like that, he's I, I've always like aspired to be somebody that can do stand-up, but it seems like they're just talking about what happened that day. Like, I've always had a, I don't know, that's always been intriguing to me, that, that, that someone can entertain an audience, but, like, keep it like a conversation, you know? Yeah, it's, it's actually, that is one of the hardest skills, I think, when it comes to stand-up, right? It's sort of yeah. making it feel like you're coming up with it on the spot and like it's casual. Totally, yeah, that is totally it. Because you're, I mean, there are, I, I'm, I'm always blown away by the amount of people that think that when they watch a stand-up special, that you are doing that that day for the first time. They're like, oh, that was great. Like you just, you just walked out there and just came off the top of your head and you're like, I did that for a year and a half. And they're like, what? <laughs> One time a friend of mine came and he goes, oh, I saw you do the show, but I remember last time I saw you, I heard one of those jokes. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> And I had to explain to him that he thought like every special he had seen that was just, just off the dome that day. <laughs> just was your friend like twelve? Yeah, years he's, a, old? he's a child. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's the third grader actually. <laughs> now I, I just I couldn't. But then I realized that in a way I get it. If if you're not keyed into how it all works, they just think oh it's a funny person walks out and they're funny and they happen to record it. Well, stand-up is one of the, I, th I think, one of the hardest art forms that also still suffers from this idea that when, pe when people watch and they don't know much about it, they're like, oh, come on, I can, anybody could do this. They're yeah, just like yeah. standing up there talking, being funny. Yeah. I could do this. And you really want to get everybody on a stage at least once to show them that, like, it's, it's really awful. Stuff. And they don't realize that the casual beats that seem like they're throwaways that get a big laugh are so uh, methodical and deliberate. And that, you know, but that's the that's the art form is that you're saying it like, yeah, anyway, and everyone laughed and they're like, oh, that's you just said that. It's like, yeah, that's a planned thing, though. That's said that way all the time. And it was figured out that doing it that way at that moment will get a big laugh. Were you like that from the beginning? I find that most comics that I talk to, their first couple years, they had a persona or something that they were trying to do or putting on, and then eventually they sort of found their yeah. way of talking like themselves on stage. Oh, yeah. It's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 like, what did you do? What I was you do? doing a bad Chris Rock impression. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like, not even knowing I was doing it, because I was such a big fan. You were doing the voice? No, I wasn't uh -huh. doing the voice, but I was like, because... When Bring the Pain came out, I was uh, like a senior in high school or something. So it's like that's the age where, you know, if you're like 18 years old and you see a special that really resonates with you, that becomes like your guiding light. Like that's the guy. And then Bigger and Blacker came out a few years later. I'm in college. And then I graduate and I start doing stand-up. And I realized like I was walking around crouching like him, like doing this and like signaling with this hand because I was just... 
I was basically just imitating what I thought was how to do stand up. Yeah. You know? But yeah, after a couple of years, you're like, I should probably knock off this horrible impression I'm doing. Did you how did you find out that it was a horrible impression? Did someone tell you or was it just something that like I'm not comfortable, I need to mm, it was a combination. I, I think I only heard something maybe once not a not a lot. It's not like people were like Hey, what are you doing? But then you, I would watch, I would see like a clip of myself and be like, oh, I can see what I'm doing. And then you start to feel that like it's inauthentic. I think that was one of the uh, great things that sort of Louis C.K.'s fame gave, gave comics, which, that is, which is that a lot of comics, when they explode, have a very specific kind of personality. And Louis always felt to me like the kind of... I don't know if you can really say this now, but like the every man who was telling amazing, funny stories. Yeah. And there wasn't a very heavily defined traits and manners that he was doing with them. Yeah. It made it hard for people to up and coming comics to mimic him in any way. That's really interesting. Yeah. I never really thought about that. I mean, yeah, it was like it was not doing a lot, like just being so casual, yeah. which um, became like a definitive style for him. Yeah. Uh, next question. Um, my question is, as a comedian, how do you deal with political correctness? Hmm. Hmm. Um, I don't know. I Talk mean, about the words in the special that you can and can't use now. And it's pretty I mean, funny. Yeah, it's, I mean, I feel like, you know, I don't have the position that political correctness is absolute and utter nonsense. Like, there's... <laughs> There's a purpose for it, you know? So it's like, I think in comedy, you're always trying to find out what's the most you can get away with, you know? And there's a reason why you can't get away with more than that. And you need the line there to, to help you figure it out. So it's like, I don't, I don't have like that thing where it's like, fuck that, I should be able to say anything and all the time, no matter, I, but I mean, I hear people that's like how they rail against it. And it's like, well, it serves a purpose. Like things change, we evolve, language changes. And then, you know, in the special, the, that bit about language is about how I basically, I'm playing the part of someone who is lamenting but accepting that words change then, and the acceptance of words change. So uh, that's kind of my real world perspective on it is like, oh, yeah, of course things are going to change over you're time. So you're also presenting a context that allows you to talk politically incorrectly. Yeah, Which exactly. is sort of the, the, the key to political correctness is, one, don't be a dick. Yeah. And two, if you want to be politically incorrect, have a context that makes it it's make sense. One of the most like ridiculous things people tell me about political correctness is they'll be like, hey, uh, would you say that joke? that is like, that they say is offensive or to like somebody's face on the street. And I'm like, no, that's <laughs> so psychotic yeah. that I would just walk up to you and start monologuing at your face. <laughs> like, and they're like, why not? I'm like, because that is exactly out of context. Like at a stand-up show, we're all in agreement that as the performer and the audience, that this is the context in which to say something that you don't say outside of here. That's the unspoken agreement, right? That I'm gonna be, the, and it's a release for both the performer and the audience. You go like, oh yeah, this is a place where you can say something that you don't say, like in conversation, or you don't say when you meet somebody, because that's what the show is. It's, it's a platform to cross the line or walk the line of maybe political correctness or any topic, you know? I, but I, I, I do find that good comics are never crossing the line. Right, because, walking the line. Yeah, when yeah. You, you cross the line by A, being a dick, or two, not presenting a context that works for the, for the words that you're using. Like, That's true. I think going back to, to Louis, I mean, there were times, what, what really bummed me out when he got taken down um, for things that were, you know, necessary in some ways, uh, were that so many jokes of his were suddenly being presented out of context and being kind of like, look, he's always been like this. And right. Look, he said this. And it's like, you are taking things that totally out of context that he said on stage that had a, a joke and a premise and were actually probably on the right side of the argument. 
and now you're making him look a certain way because the words are there. I know. Well, it's one of the it's people's favorite thing to do. I mean, when they bring someone down or attack someone, and especially when it's related to stand up, yeah. is to take a transcript of stand up. Like you cannot break down the intent and the way that a bit was presented in written form if it's for, from stand up. Because without seeing it, like if you're just reading it, every stand up thing could be just the most horrific thing you've ever read. <laughs> because it's like, it's just the words. You're not seeing the tone that it's set in, you're not hearing the context of maybe the larger premise or the, the, the bit that how it's being presented. You don't know if it's said sarcastically, satirically, ironically. All these things are just out the window and they go, no, but you said this, this, and this. And then people go like, that is really terrible. And you're like, well, yeah, you, you have no idea how it was actually said at the time. Like, no, I was playing the character that was terrible yeah. and that's yeah. why I said like, no, 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 no. Yeah. you said it. But that's also done in reference like to what you're saying about, you know, about him that that it's like but th li listen to this sentence and you're like yeah. okay sure I'm always like i remember when he said it that was pretty funny yeah <laughs> uh, i think we have time for one more question hi over here um hello <laughs> uh so you mentioned before how some of your best jokes are very deliberate and very you know well written and kind of practiced uh do you find that podcasting is the same way or do you think it's more of a freer medium for you to you know maybe practice some work before a stand up oh that's a good question i think it's definitely much more free form and organic. And it's just, you know, sometimes you end up talking on stage about the thing that you podcasted about because you were so casual and so relaxed, so unrehearsed that it presented to you a truly free form, natural thought. And then you go like, oh, there's actually something there. Mm -hmm. But all the riffing and stuff, like the way I, we podcast is 100% uh, like, you know, off off the cuff. There's no nothing written, no, no bit, like, worked out. So, yeah, when you do hit a really funny beat or, or topic, um, it feels very natural, which, which it is. And some, sometimes you realize you can take it to the stage. Do the two of you discuss who gets to take it to the stage? It's pretty quick. I mean, <laughs> there's not really an argument about it. It's right. kind of like... You can tell whose joke it was and how to, yeah. Pretty much. I mean, sometimes it'll be the thing, like... Uh, let's say I say an idea, like, and and then that's a that's a good place to explore. Mm -hmm. She says the funny thing about my idea. She'll go, "That's your," but you you know what I mean. You brought up the topic, so even though I said the joke, it's your topic. It's, it's usually like who initiates right. the like. There was the genesis of bringing up that point not who said the funny thing about it. Right, who wanted to explore this first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's usually how it goes. Uh, Tom, I love the special. I love the podcast. Thank Thanks you. for stopping by. Uh, it's on Netflix right now. It is. And people can uh, listen to Your Mom's House on uh, iTunes podcasts. And yes, everywhere. and there's two other specials on oh, Netflix too. Yes. So if you, have, if you, if you like it, watch the other ones. And if you don't like this one, maybe you'll like the other ones. Tom Scare, everybody, yeah. let's hear it. Yeah. Thank you.